There was a slave revolt in 1811 on what is known as the German coast of the territory of Orleans. I'll tell you more about it coming up. This is KRT, Critical Race Theory. It's not the one they teach in law schools, but the one banned in public schools. I don't speak French, so if I mispronounce some of these names, please forgive me. The slave revolt was the largest in U.S. history, and here's how it went down. On January 6, 1811, a group of enslaved plantation workers gathered at the home of Manuel Andre. As plantation owner James Brown testified, Quamina, Harry, Kenner, and Anderson were there to have a discussion with the leader of the rebellion, Charles Deslandes. News of the planned rebellion had been communicated among the slaves in plantations located all along the Mississippi River, known as the German Coast. The Andre Plantation Revolt started on January 8th when the enslaved men struck a seriously injured Manuel Andre, then killed his son Gilbert. Andre was quoted as saying, an attempt was made to assassinate me by a stroke of an ax. My poor son has been murdered by a horde of brigands from my plantation and that of Mr. Fortier have committed all the mischief and excesses that can be expected from a gang of atrocious bandits. For some reason, I can't feel sorry for this guy. The rebellion quickly gained momentum with about 15 enslaved laborers from Andre's plantation joining an additional eight from the adjoining holdings of Widows Jocks and George Deslandes. This was the home estate of Charles Delandis, an enslaved overseer who was described by one of the captives as the principal chief of the brigands. As they marched on, small groups of slaves joined their numbers at each plantation they approached. Witnesses noted that they were organized and carried mostly pikes, hoes, and axes. Although there were a few firearms, drums could be heard and some had flags gotta have those drums. On usually high percentages, between 10 and 25 percent of slaves joined them from many estates. An active participant and key figure in the story of the uprisings is Cook. He joined the rebellion at the plantation of James Brown and attacked and killed Francois Trepagagne with an axe at the next plantation down. They stopped at the physician's house after passing the LaBranche plantation. When Cook found him gone, he set his house on fire. At the trials, some planters testified that they were alerted of the impending uprising. Others who remained in New Orleans and relied on overseers to maintain their properties swiftly crossed the Mississippi River in order to flee and form a militia. As they navigated downriver, more enslaved people joined them from larger plantations. The largest plantation located on the German coast, Mu Ilion, fell victim to destruction and pillage as rebels tried to set it ablaze. However, Basil, one of its slaves, was able to stop this act of arson and ultimately save his home. After nightfall, the slaves who had managed to escape reached Cannes Brulees, which is about 15 miles northwest of New Orleans. This trip was likely to have taken between 7 and 10 hours, covering a distance of 14 to 22 miles. Reports of the exact number of people varied. Some claimed that there were 200, while others estimate there were around 500. The majorities of these individuals were males aged 20 to 30 years old. Most had worked in hard conditions on sugar plantations and their life expectancy was understandably low. On January 9th, news of the German coast insurrection had spread across New Orleans. In response, Governor Claiborne sent two companies of volunteer militia and 30 U.S. Army soldiers with Commodore John Shaw, who also dispatched 40 sailors from the U.S. Navy to intercept the escaping slaves. Man, this is not going to be pretty. Just after midnight, 
the troops encountered Jacques Fortier's plantation. By this point, the slaves had already journeyed up river for about 15 miles. The local militia soon discovered them near Bernard Bernoudi's plantation around nine o'clock and initiated an attack that left approximately 40 to 45 dead while others escaped into nearby woods and swamps. Damn. Despite difficult conditions, Parrott's and Andrew's men attempted to pursue them, but ultimately failed. On January 11th, militia, assisted by Native American trackers as well as hunting dogs, captured Charles DeLandis, whom Andrew considered the principal leader of the bandits. A slave driver and son of a white man and a slave, DeLandis received no trial or interrogation. Here's where it gets rough. During his execution, his hands were chopped off, and then shot in one leg and thigh, and then the other, until they were both broken. And then he was shot in the body, and before he died, he was put into a bundle of straw and roasted. His cries under the torture likely intimidated other escaped slaves in the marshes. The following day, Pierre Greffet and Hans Wemprin who were thought to be the murderers of M. Thomasin and M. Francois Trepagagne were captured, killed, and their hands hacked off for delivery to the Andrea State. Major Milton and the dragoons from Baton Rouge arrived and provided support for the militia. Militias killed roughly 95 enslaved individuals in the aftermath of the battle including those who were caught and executed without trial, as well as those put to death after being tried. According to documents, most of the leaders appear to be mixed race Creole or mulatto. However, some of the slaves were native Africans. In particular, 56 were captured on the 10th and returned to their masters, while 30 more escaping slaves were detained but granted amnesty by planters when it became evident that they had been coerced into joining Charles Delande's revolt. However, some of the enslaved people opted against insurrection due to not wanting to see their homes destroyed. The revolt was quickly brought under control with the local authorities backed up by the U.S. Navy in exchange for payments of $300 for every executed slave. While the exact number of slaves who died during the revolt is not known, it is estimated that about 100 slaves were involved in the rebellion and that the death toll may have been between 20 and 100 people. Some accounts suggest that the rebels were severely punished, with some being executed by firing squad or having their heads displayed on poles as a warning to other slaves. The event was widely reported in the national press at the time with Americans both North and South pondering over how it arose from wrongs endured by those subjugated under slavery. This has been Critical Race Theory. Thanks for checking in. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and family. I'll see you next time.